and welcome to Peter Presents Iliad. Now, before we begin, I just wanted to do a little something special. You may have noticed there's something a little different about my appearance this time. If you're typically listening, um, you can uh, come and look over for a second and see that, yes, I am in fact doing something absolutely absurd. I am hiding my beautiful face from my adoring audience, I say facetiously. But, yes, uh, in, it doesn't take a genius to understand what's going on here. As we all uh, know, there is a pandemic, a bit of a quarantine going on. And I, in fact, am uh, keeping up with the fashions of the day by wearing this mask. Now, this is a very special mask because it was made, in fact, by my older sister, who is also my little sister. And if you see how short she is, you will understand why that's our little family joke. You see... Uh, she makes these masks now, and they have, in fact, become her primary source of income because, like many of us, uh, she lost her job during this uh, situation. But she rose to the occasion and started to do very heroic things such as make masks. And there is actually a link to her website, uh, to the page where she makes these masks, in the description below if you are so interested. In fact, she has different patterns. This one's a very special one from the Isle of Skye. Uh, which is in the UK, and um, has a little bit of personal history to me. So um, she was able to provide this special limited edition fabric um, for my personal taste. But they are also double-sided, so I can have it be a very classy, snazzy red if I want to. But she has adjustable ones for different sizes, uh, for if you wear glasses as well. So um, if you are going to uh, look ever so safe and healthy in these ridiculous times. Uh, everyone's wearing masks these days, and you don't want to just wear some dinky little thing that you got from who knows where that is always re that isn't even reusable. You can wash these things. They're adjustable. They're uh, absolutely fantastic. So um, I'm not just saying that because she's my sister. I've worn it, you know, when I needed to and stuff, and they're actually uh, comfortable and stylish, and they work very well, and you can throw them through the wash. So anyway, with that... That's that. Um, but yes, let us continue on with our epic story. I'm so excited that um, there are people who actually watch this show. I cannot tell you how excited it makes me, after all. Um, because I'm going to, even if there was no one here, I would be doing it anyway because I just love this book so dadgum mush, much mush. <laughs> and um, in fact, uh, something I hadn't been doing, but I'm going to go back and do with the previous videos, and you'll see in the description of this video as well, is there is a link if you wish to purchase one of these fantastic copies of uh, this most excellent translation of Homer's Iliad by Stanley Lombardo. As I always say in the opening credits, uh, none of this stuff is associated, uh, blah, 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 you know, disclaimer, etc., with um, Stanley Lombardo and Hackett Publishing. They just, in their infinite goodness and kindness, have allowed me to use this translation for this show, and for that, I, and I hope my audience, are extremely grateful. But, enough of the commercials out of the way. Um, oh, no, I'm not sponsored, by the way, by Kelsey or anything, I'm just like, hey, people need masks, all that stuff, uh, so hey, here you go. Um, anyway, so I, I do encourage you to check that out. Uh, if you've been putting it off, not sure where to get them, you don't, and if you're worried about getting a mask from a place where they have a limited supply and uh, you want to make sure that the m people in the medicine areas, you know, are at the hospitals and such are getting their masks and you don't want to deplete that supply, well, hey, you just you go go over to Kelsey uh, on our website in the um, description below. Now, last episode was uh, quite lengthy, although so fun, wasn't it? I thought so. Um, and Diomedes was, uh, you know, um, I think as they say in a very famous film recently, um, taking ass and kicking names, I believe that's the phrase. And, uh, but we're going to continue on the battlefield. But this is a very uh, special episode, as you may have seen from the excellent uh, thumbnail of me cradling my little baby Iliad there, um, because we're going to get into some very interesting, intimate moments, which uh, I I thought I knew most of what I would talk about uh, for this show before I started, and that I'd, you know, reach up, research stuff to just kind of brush up on my knowledge, and uh, I've gotten into so many rabbit holes that I cannot wait to share with you after this reading when we go through our analysis and commentary, and hopefully we'll get some cool questions out of it as well, or just some discussion in the chat. 
So without too much further ado, I uh, hope you have an excellent drink with you of some kind. Because now we shall begin again with episode six, book six of Homer's Iliad. Uh, if you remember correctly, uh, when we last left off, uh, we were on the battlefield and um, uh, Diomedes was uh, killing lots of people. So it's Trojans and Greeks all fighting each other. So, <clears throat> let us begin again. The battle was left to rage on the level expanse between Troy's two rivers. Bronze spearheads drove past each other as the Greek and Trojan armies spread like a hemorrhage across the plain. Telamonian Ajax, the Achaean Wall, was the first Greek to break the Trojan line and give his comrades some daylight. He killed Thrace's best, Akamas, son of Eusorus, smashing through the horn of his plumed helmet with his spear and driving through until the bronze tip pierced the forehead's bone. Akamas's eyes went dark. Diomedes followed up by killing Axylus, Teuthrius' son, a most hospitable man. His comfortable home was on the road to Arisbe, and he entertained all travelers. But not one came by to meet the enemy before him and save him from death. Diomedes killed not only Axylus, but Calesius, Kel his driver two men who would now be covered by earth. Then Euryalus killed Ophelsius and Dresus and went on after Asipus and Padassus, twins from the Naiad of Barbaria, bore to Bucolion, Laomedon's eldest, though bastard, son. He was with his sheep when he made love to the nymph. She conceived and bore him the twins, whom Euralius now undid. He left her their bright bodies naked. Then Polypoites killed Astyalus. Odysseus, Odysseus got Pidites with his spear and took her to Aretion, a good man. Nestor's son, Antilochus, killed Alborus. The warlord Agamemnon killed Elatus, who lived in steep Padasis on the Satniosis. Leotus killed Phylacus as he fled, and Eurypolis, Eurypolis, Eurypolis unmanned Melanthius. But Menelaus took Adrastus alive. Adrastus' terrified horses became entangled in a tamarisk as they galloped across the plain, and breaking the pole near the car's rim, bolted toward the city with the others. Their master rolled from the car by the wheel and fell face first into the dust. Menelaus came up to him with his long shadowed spear, and Adrastus clasped his knees and prayed, Take me alive, son of Atreus, and accept a worthy ransom from the treasure stored in my father's palace. Bronze, gold, wrought iron. My father would lavish it all on you if he heard I was still alive among the Achaean ships. The speech had its intended effect. Menelaus was about to hand him over to be led back to the ships. But Agamemnon came running over to call him on it. Going soft, Menelaus, what does this man mean to you? Have the Trojans ever shown you any hospitality? Not one of them escapes sheer death at our hands. Not even the boy who is still in his mother's womb. Every Trojan dies, unmourned and unmarked. And so the hero changed his brother's mind by reminding him of the ways of conduct and fate. Menelaus shoved Adrastus aside, and Agamemnon stabbed him in the flank. He fell backward, and the son of Atreus braced his heel on his chest and pulled out the spear. Then Nestor shouted and called to the Greeks, Soldiers of Greece, no lagging behind to strip off armor for the, from the enemy's corpses to see who comes back to the ships with the most. Now we kill men. You will have plenty of time later to despoil the Trojan dead on the plain. 
Nestor's speech worked them up to a frenzy, and the Trojans would have been beaten back to Ilion by superior force had not Helenus, Priam's son and Troy's prophet, approached Aeneas and Hector. Aeneas and Hector, the Trojans and Lycians are counting on you. You two are the leaders in every initiative, in council and battle. So make us stand, here. Go through the ranks and keep our men back from the gates before they run through them and fall into their women's arms, making our enemies laugh. Once you have bolstered our troops' morale, we will stand our ground and fight the Danaeans, tired as we are. We have our backs to the wall. Hector, go into the city and find our mother. Tell her to take a company of old women to the temple of Athena on the Acropolis with the largest and loveliest robe in her house, the one that is dearest of all to her, and place it on the knees of braided Athena. And promise twelve heifers to her in the temple, unblemished yearlings if she will pity the town of Troy, its wives and its children, and if she will keep from holy Ilion wild Diomedes who is raging with his spear. I think he's the strongest of all the Achaeans. We never even feared Achilles like this, and they say he is half divine. But this man won't stop at anything. No one can match him. Hector took his brother's advice. He jumped down from his chariot with his gear and toured the ranks, a spear in each hand. He urged them on, and with a trembling roar, the Trojans turned to face the Achaeans. The Greeks pulled back. It looked to them as if some god had come from the starry sky to help the Trojans. It had been a sudden rally. Hector shouted and called to the Trojans, Soldiers of Troy and illustrious allies, remember to fight like the men that you are, while I go to the city and ask the elders to sit in council and our wives to pray to the gods and promise bulls by the hundred. And Hector left, helmet collecting light above the black hide shield whose room tapped his room tapped his ankles and neck with each step he took. Then Glaucus son of Hippolochus, met Diomedes in no man's land. Both were eager to fight, but first Tydeus' son made his voice heard above the battle noise. And which mortal hero are you? I've never seen you out here before on the fields of glory, and now here you are ahead of everyone, ready to face my spear. Pretty bold. I feel sorry for your parents, of course. <laughs> You may be an immortal, down from heaven. Far be it from me to fight an immortal god. Not even mighty Lycurgus lived long after he tangled with the immortals, driving the nurses of Dionysus down over the mountain of Nisa, and making them drop their wands, he beat them with an ox goad. Dionysus was terrified and plunged into the sea, where Thetis received them into her bosom, trembling with fear at the human threats. Then the gods... Who live is he? Grew angry with Lycurgus, and son of Cronus made him go blind, and he did not live long, hated as he was by the immortal gods. No, I wouldn't want to fight an immortal, but if ye are human and shed blood, step right up for a quick end to your life. And Glaucus, Hippolochus' son, great son of Tydeus, why ask about my lineage? Human generations are like leaves in their seasons. The wind blows them to the ground, but the tree sprouts new ones when spring comes again. Men, too. Their generations come and go. But if you really do want to hear my story, you're welcome to listen. Many men know it. Ephyra, in the heart of Argive horse country, was home to Sisyphus, the shrewdest man alive. Sisyphus, son of Aeolus, he had a son, Glaucus, who was the father of faultless Bellerophon, a man of grace and courage by gift of the gods. But Protus, whom Zeus had made king of Argos, came to hate Bellerophon and drove him out. It happened this way. 
Protus' wife, the beautiful Antia, was madly in love with Bellerophon and wanted to have him in her bed. But she couldn't persuade him, not at all, because he was so virtuous and wise. <laughs> so she made up lies and spoke to the king. Either die yourself, Protus, or kill Bellerophon. He wanted to sleep with me against my will. The king was furious when he heard her say this. He did not kill him. He had scruples about that, but he sent him to Lycia with a folding tablet on which he had scratched many evil signs and told him to give it to Antia's father to get him killed. So off he went to Lycia with an immortal escort, and when he reached the river Xanthus, the king there welcomed him and honored him with entertainment for nine solid days, killing an ox each day. But when the tenth dawn spread her rosy light, he questioned him and asked to see the tokens he brought from Protus, his daughter's husband. And when he saw the evil tokens from Protus, he ordered him first to kill the Chimera, a raging monster, divine, inhuman, a lion in the front, a serpent in the rear, and in the middle a goat, and breathing fire. Bellerophon killed her, trusting signs from the gods. Next he had to fight the glorious Salimi, the hardest battle he said he ever fought, and the third, the Amazons, women the peers of men. As he journeyed back, the king wove another while. He chose the best men in all wide Lycia and laid an ambush. Not one returned home. Blameless Bellerophon killed them all. When the king realized his guest, ha guest had divine blood, he kept him there and gave him his daughter and half of all his royal honor. Moreover, the Lycians cut out for him a superb tract of land, plow land, and orchard. His wife, the princess, bore him three children, Isander, Hippolochus, and Laodamia. Zeus, in his wisdom, slept with Laodamia, and she bore him the godlike warrior Sarpedon. But even Bellerophon lost the gods' favor and went wandering alone over the Aelian plain. His son, Isander, was slain by Ares as he fought against the glorious Selimi and his daughter was killed by Artemis of the Golden Reigns. But Hippolochus bore me, and I am proud he is my father. He sent me to Troy with strict instructions to be the best ever, better than all the rest, and not to bring shame on the race of my fathers, the noblest men in Ephria and Lycia. This... I am proud to say is my lineage. Diomedes grinned when he heard all this. He planted his spear in the bounteous earth and spoke gently to the Lycian prince. We have old ties of hospitality. My grandfather, Oeneus, long ago entertained Bellerophon in his halls for twenty days, and they gave each other gifts of friendship. Oeneus gave a belt bright with scarlet, and Bellerophon a golden cup, which I left at home. I don't remember my father Tidius, since I was very small when he left for Thebes in the war that killed so many Achaeans. But that makes me your friend, and you my guest, if ever you come to Argos, as you are my friend, and I your guest whenever I travel to Lycia. So we can't cross spears with each other, even in the thick of battle. There are enough Trojans and allies for me to kill, whomever a god gives me and who I can run down myself, and enough Greeks for you to kill as you can. And let's exchange armor, so everyone will know that we are friends from our father's days. With this said, they vaulted from their chariots, clasped hands, and pledged their friendship. But Zeus took away Glaucus's good sense, for he exchanged his golden armor for bronze, the worth of one hundred oxen for nine. When Hector reached the oak tree by the western gate, 
Trojan wives and daughters ran up to him, asking about their children, their brothers, their kinsmen, their husbands. He told them all, each woman in turn, to pray to the gods. Sorrow clung to their heads like mist. Then he came to Priam's palace, a beautiful building made of polished stone with a central courtyard flanked by porticos among which opened 50 adjoining rooms where Priam's sons slept with their wives. Across the court, a suit of 12 more bedrooms housed his modest daughters and their husbands. It was here that Hector's mother met him, a gracious woman with Laodice, her most beautiful daughter in tow. Hecuba took his hand in hers and said, Hector, my son, why have you left the war and come here? Are those abominable Greeks wearing you down in the fighting outside? And does your heart lead you to our Acropolis to stretch your hands upward toward Zeus? But stay here while I get you some honey sweet wine so you can pour a libation to Father Zeus first and the other immortals, then enjoy some yourself if you will drink. Wine greatly bolsters a weary man's spirits and you are weary from defending your kinsmen. Sunlight shimmered on great Hector's helmet. Mother, don't offer me any wine. <laughs> it would drain the power out of my limbs. I have too much reverence to pour a libation with unwashed hands to Zeus Almighty, or to pray to Cronion in the black cloud banks, spattered with blood and the filth of battle. But you must go to the war goddess's temple to make sacrifice with a band of old women. Choose the largest and loveliest robe in the house the one that is dearest of all to you, and place it on the knees of braided Athena and promise twelve heifers to her in her temple, unblemished yearlings, if she will pity the town of Troy, its wives and its children, and if she will keep from holy Ilion wild Diomedes, who's raging with his spear. Go then to the temple of Athena, the war goddess, and I will go over to summon Paris he will listen to what I have to say. I wish the earth would gape open beneath him. Olympian Zeus has bred him as a curse to Troy, to Priam and all Priam's children. If I could see him dead and gone to Hades, I think my heart might be eased of its sorrow. Thus Hector. Hecuba went to the great hall and called to her handmaidens, and they gathered together the city's old women. She went herself to a fragrant storeroom, which held her robes, the exquisite work of Sidonian women, whom godlike Paris brought from Phoenicia when he sailed the sea on the voyage he made for high-born Helen. Hecuba chose the robe that lay at the bottom, the most beautiful of all, woven of starlight, and bore it away as a gift for Athena. A stream of old women followed behind. They came to the temple of Pallas Athena on the city's high rock, and the doors were opened by fair-cheeked Theano, daughter of Sisius, and wife of Antenor, breaker of horses. The Trojans had made for Athena's priestess. With ritual cries, they all lifted their hands to Pallas Athena. Theano took the robe and laid it on the knees of the rich-haired goddess, then prayed in supplication to Zeus's daughter. Lady Athena, who defends our city, brightest of goddesses, hear our prayer. Break now the spear of Diomedes, and grant that he fall before the western gate, that we may now offer twelve heifers in this temple, unblemished yearlings. Only do thou pity the town of Troy, its wives, and its children. But Pallas Athena denied her prayer. While they prayed to great Zeus's daughter, 
Hector came to Paris, his beautiful house, which he had built himself with the aid of the best craftsmen in all wide Troy. Sleeping quarters, a hall, and a central courtyard near to Priam's and Hector's on the city's high rock. Hector entered. Zeus is light upon him, a spear sixteen feet long cradled in his hand, the bronze point gleaming and the feral gold. He found Paris in the bedroom, busy with his weapons, fondling his curved bow, his fine shield, and breastplate. Helen of Argo sat with her household women, directing their exquisite handicraft. Hector meant to shame Paris and provoke him. This is a fine time to be nursing your anger, you idiot. We're dying out there defending the walls. It's because of you the city is in this hellish war. If you saw someone else holding back from combat, you'd pick a fight with him yourself. Now get up before the whole city goes up in flames! And Paris, handsome as a god, That's no more than just, Hector. Just listen now to what I have to say. It's not out of anger or spite toward the Trojans. I've been here in my room. I only wanted to recover from my pain. My wife was just now encouraging me to get up and fight, and that seems the better thing to do. Victory takes turns with men. Wait for me while I put on my armor, or go on ahead. I'm pretty sure I'll catch up with you. To which Hector said nothing. But Helen said to him softly, Brother-in-law of a scheming cold-blooded bitch, I wish that on the day my mother bore me, a windstorm had swept me away to a mountain or into the waves of the restless sea, swept me away before all this could happen. But since the gods have ordained these, ev these evils, why couldn't I be the wife of a better man? One sensitive, at least to repeated reproaches. Paris has never had an ounce of good sense and never will. He'll pay for it some day. But come inside and sit down on this chair, dear brother-in-law. You bear such a burden for my wanton ways and Paris's witlessness. Zeus has placed this evil fate on us so that in time to come, poets will sing of us. And Hector, in his burnished helmet, don't ask me to sit, Helen, even though you love me. You will never persuade me. My heart is out there with our fighting men. They already feel my absence from battle. Just get Paris moving and have him hurry so he can catch up with me while I'm still inside the city. I'm going to my house now to see my family, my wife, and my boy. I don't know whether I'll ever be back to see them again, or if the gods will destroy me at the hands of the Greeks. And Hector turned and left. He came to his house, but, not, but did not find white-armed Andromache there. She had taken the child and a robed attendant, and stood on the tower, lamenting and weeping his blameless wife. When Hector didn't find her inside, he paused on his way out and called to the servants. Can any of you women tell me exactly where Andromache went when she left the house? To one of my sisters or one of my brother's wives or to the temple of Athena along with the other Trojan women to beseech the dread goddess? The spry old housekeeper answered him. Hector, if you want the exact truth, she didn't go to any of your sisters or any of your brother's wives or to the temple of Athena along with the other Trojan women to beseech the dread goddess. She went to Ilion's great tower because she heard the Trojans were pressed and the Greeks were strong. She ran off to the wall like a mad woman and the nurse went with her, carrying the child. 
thus the housekeeper. But Hector was gone, retracing his steps through the stone and tile streets of the great city until he came to the western gate. He was passing through it out onto the plain when his wife came running up to meet him, his beautiful wife, Andromache, a gracious woman, daughter of great Iashon, Iashon who lived in the forests of Placos and ruled the Sicilians, Cilicians, from Thebes under Placos. His daughter was wed to bronze-helmeted Hector. She came up to him now, and the nurse with her held to her bosom their baby boy, Hector's beloved son, beautiful as starlight, whom Hector had named Scamandrius, but everyone else called Astyanax, lord of the city. For Hector alone could save Ilion now. He looked at his son and smiled in silence. Andromache stood close to him, shedding tears, clinging to his arm as she spoke these words. Possessed is what you are, Hector. Your courage is going to kill you, and you have no feeling left for your little boy or for me, the luckless woman who will soon be your widow. It won't be long before the whole Greek army swarms and kills you, and when they do, it will be better for me to sink into the earth. When I lose you, Hector... There will be nothing left, no one to turn to, only pain. My father and mother are dead. Achilles killed my father when he destroyed our city, Thebes, with its high gates, but had too much respect to despoil his body. He burned it instead with all his armor and heaped up a barrow, and the spirit woman came down from the mountain, daughters of the storm god, and planted elm trees around it. I had seven brothers once in that great house. All seven went down to Hades on a single day, cut down by Achilles in one blinding sprint through their shambling cattle and silver sheep. Mother, who was queen in the forests of Placos, he took back as prisoner with all her possessions, then released her for a fortune and ransom. She died in our house, shot by Artemis' arrows. Hector, you are my father, you are my mother, you are my brother and my blossoming husband. But show some pity and stay here by the tower. Don't make your child an orphan, your wife a widow. Station your men here by the fig tree, where the city is weakest because the wall can be scaled. Three times their elite have tried an attack here, rallying around Ajax, or glorious Edominius, or Atreus' sons, or mighty Diomedes. Whether someone in on the prophecy told them, or they are driven here by something in their heart. And great Hector, helmet shining, answered her. Yes, Andromache. I worry about all this myself, but my shame before the Trojans and their wives, with their long robes trailing, would be too terrible if I hung back from battle like a coward, and my heart won't let me. I have learned to be one of the best, to fight in Troy's first ranks, defending my father's honor and my own. Deep in my heart, I know too well there will come a day when holy Ilion will perish and Priam and the people under Priam's ash spear. But the pain I will feel for the Trojans then, for Hecuba herself and for Priam king, for my many fine brothers who will have by then fallen in the dust behind enemy lines, all that pain is nothing to what I will feel for you when some bronze-armored Greek leads you away in tears on your first day of slavery, and you will work some other woman's loom in Argos or carry water from a Spartan spring all against your will under great duress 
and someone seeing you crying will say, This is the wife of Hector, the best of all the Trojans, when they fought around Ilion. Someday someone will say that, renewing your pain at having lost such a man to fight off the day of your enslavement. But may I be dead and the earth heaped up above me before I hear your cry as you are dragged away. With these words, resplendent Hector reached for his child, who shrank back screaming into his nurse's bosom, terrified of his father's bronze-encased face and the horsehair plume he saw nodding down from the helmet's crest. This forced a laugh from his father and mother, and Hector removed the helmet from his head and set it on the ground, all shimmering with light. Then he kissed his dear son and swung him up gently and said a prayer to Zeus and the other immortals. Zeus and all gods, grant that this, my son, become as I am, foremost among Trojans, brave and strong, <laughs> and ruling Ilion with might. And may men say he is far better than his father when he returns from war bearing bloody spoils having killed his man and may his mother rejoice and he put his son in the arms of his wife and she enfolded him in her fragrant bosom laughing through her tears Hector pitied her and stroked her with his hand and said to her you worry too much about me, Andromache. No one is going to send me to Hades before my time, and no man has ever escaped his fate, rich or poor, coward or hero, once born into this world. Go back to the house now and take care of your work, the loom and the shuttle, and tell the servants to get on with their jobs. War is the work of men, of all the Trojan men, and mine especially. With these words, Hector picked up his plumed helmet, and his wife went back home, turning around often, her cheeks flowered with tears. When she came to the house of manslaying Hector, she found a throng of servants inside, and raised among these women the ritual lament. And so they mourned for Hector in his house, although he was still alive, for they did not think he would ever again come back from the war or escape the murderous hands of the Greeks. Paris, meanwhile, did not dally long in his high halls. He put on his magnificent bronze inlaid gear and sprinted with assurance out through the city. Picture a horse that has fed on barley in his stall, breaking his halter and galloping across the plain, making for his accustomed swim in the river. A glorious animal, head held high, mane streaming like wind on his shoulders. Sure of his splendor, he prances by the horse runs and the mares in pasture. That was how Paris, son of Priam, came down from the high rock of Pergamum, gleaming like amber and laughing in his armor, and his feet were fast. He caught up quickly with Hector, just as he turned from the spot where he'd talked with his wife, and called out, Well, dear brother, have I delayed you too much? Am I not here in time, just as you asked? Hector turned, his helmet flashing light. I don't understand you, Paris. No one could slight your work in battle. You're a strong fighter, but you slack off. You don't have the will. It breaks my heart to hear what the Trojans say about you. It's on your account they have all this trouble. Come on. Let's go. We can settle this later, if Zeus ever allows us to offer in our halls the wine bowl of freedom to the gods above after we drive these bronze-kneed Greeks from Troy.
Dun, da, da. And that is the end of book six. Wow. What an interesting one. I mean interesting in a good way, not in the art school way when you don't know how to give critical feedback to your peers. Um, it's personal. There's um, So yeah, let's look at some of this text. It's so interesting to see how this story is unfolding because we start in the Greek camp and it's like obviously it's not a movie but it's like the camera goes from the Greek ships all the way across the plain through the battle and then into the city you know as far as the location you know like we get our first glimpse of like really the inside of Troy we've been on the wall before and I guess we have that scene with um, Helen and Aphrodite with Paris a little while back which uh, is one of my least favorite parts of the book for personal reasons <laughs> I hate Paris um, but it's just so cool to see like we get inside the city and we like hear about the tiles and like just the Acropolis now there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about here um, you know one thing that's so interesting is because in our last I think it was last episode it might have been the episode before but Joe had asked why some Greek gods and goddesses favor different cities. And we talked about how Ilion, or Troy, is actually Zeus's favorite city, which is such a weird thing, because, you know, Zeus is the head of all the gods, and the, like, the target audience for this was the Greeks. And so they're finding out that their chief deity, his favorite city, was the enemy. And it's so weird to see that, because the... I mean, clearly you'd want God on your side, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, although Zeus hasn't taken sides, Zeus hasn't taken sides yet or anything. He's just like, oh, well, I, I love this city. It's, it's great. They're very religious and all that. But we see that there's an Acropolis, all right? Acropolis is like the tall point in the city, like the natural tall rock formation. And at the top of that Acropolis is a temple to Athena. Now... We talked before about how Athens is the city for Athena in Greece, all right? So, like Athens, Athena, you know, she might have gotten her name from the city or the city got their name from her. We're not totally sure. But um, it's so interesting that in Athens, at the top of their Acropolis, where I have been, which I can't believe it didn't occur to me to put a picture of me at the Acropolis in here, so I'll have to do that for you next time. But at the top of the Athenian Acropolis is the Parthenon, which is Athena's temple. Now, at the time of this war, I don't think the um, Parthenon was built yet. In fact, I think it was several centuries later. I'll double check for you guys, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. So, um, it's uh, and Athens was not a was not typically looked at as a very important Greek city until the Persian Wars, where they uh, almost single-handedly defeated the Persians at the Battle of Marathon. Uh, which was in about 490 BC. And if you think about how this battle's taking place in about 1260-ish BC, maybe, or 1100 BC, like a long time before, and then you think about how Homer was um, supposed to be around probably in 800 BC, there's a little wonky bit of a timeline there. Now, uh, so we got Battle of Troy, eight, like 1200 BC, then you got Homer, 800 BC, and then in like 490 BC, ages later, is when Athens becomes a bigger power in Greece. Now, uh, so we have that. I think it's so interesting how Andromache, like this is, we get a really, um, well, uh, I'll, I'll go I'll go through the chapter instead of jumping around, all right? So we start on the field of battle, right? And we're back with Diomedes, you know, and he comes across Glaucus. He doesn't recognize him. He's basically like, who are you? And Glaucus is like, I mean, a lot of people know who I am, but if you don't, uh, I mean, I, I'll tell you if you want to know. And he lays out this huge, incredible back, like lineage, of, like where his grandfather was the guy who defeated the Chimera. All right, that's a hugely famous Greek story. It's like, yeah, that was my grandfather. It's like I do the same exact thing because. 
I mean, I don't know if you know who I'm related to, uh, but my ancestors basically saved the world from an axis of, of darkness uh, in the Second World War. Woohoo! And uh, Royal Navy all the way. But, um, you know, that's uh, staying, staying to the story here. Uh, Bellerophon was the guy who defeated, who killed the Chimera. And anyway, so Glaucus gets through this whole thing. And he's like, that's who I am, and I'm pretty dadgum proud of it. And by the end of it, Diomedes is like, I friggin' love this guy. <laughs> you know, it's like, have you ever had that moment where you start off like, who's this loser? And then you find out a little bit, like they hit someone you don't like or whatever, you know, like, and they, and you just go like, man, come over here, have a drink, you know, let me find out more about this dude. And they end up exchanging gifts on the battlefield. They stop fighting, and they're like, here, let's exchange gifts. And when this is all over, you come to my place. I'll go to your place. We'll hang out. It'll be awesome. We let's. There's plenty of other people for us to kill. We'll avoid each other. You know, you and I, we're buddies. So they have friends on opposite sides. Okay, now this sounds insane, okay, to us today. But... This kind of thing has happened. And one of the things that, that's one of the things that makes this book so weirdly realistic is that um, probably the greatest example for that kind of thing, like almost camaraderie across two sides, was the Union and the Confederates for the war between the states, um, where they all knew each other like all the officers went to west point all of them studied under uh robert e lee they all were in the same classes together and you have these crazy stories in that war where the entire battle stops and watches two guys have a fist fight where they're like okay we could either kill each other or we could basically wrestle whoever wins takes the other one prisoner like that happened or like a Union soldier would be wounded, like shot in the stomach, which makes you very thirsty, by the way, although you shouldn't drink water, but that's what, when you get a stomach wound, you get really, really thirsty. You just want to drink something, anything. You're dying of thirst. And you'll have like a Union soldier who's in the middle, you know, uh, sort of like a failed charge, and he's got a stomach wound. He's like, water, water. And then a Confederate soldier will grab a canteen and run out to him, under fire of both sides and we'll give him water and then both sides see what he's doing they're like that guy's the best you know and then the guy in the middle of the field dies and the confederate gets back and they get back to fighting and killing each other it's it's like it seems so insane but that kind of thing has happened in war now uh and by the way i think one reason why that may have been so prevalent in the war between the states was because I believe, um, I need to double check this, but I believe that everybody at West Point at that time read Iliad. Um, and uh, and I, I need to double check that, but like the Iliad was wildly popular at that time in America as well. So it's, um, it's extremely, I mean, most people today know about this story too. It's like, so back, like within reason, you know, but back then it's like, that's what these guys read. <laughs> so, um, perhaps there were soldiers throughout history, not just the civil war, but throughout history who learned about scenes like this, where two people come together and, maybe that encouraged them to do that in real battles. Now today, um, I don't like to make big sweeping statements about American culture because sometimes when people say, oh, America's like this or that, it usually just means half of the country or just one side of an argument. And I don't want to get into that right now, <laughs> but something that's very common in American culture is that your enemy or opponent or the other side like you you're supposed to hate them and it, no matter what little thing it is they did that you totally just steamroll them all right and i don't know exactly where that came from um there's a uh but if you look at some of american war history like the revolutionary war not too long after that we were allies with the british okay um, but if you say, if you take like, I mean, obviously Germany and, 
uh, America in World War II. It's like, well, we're on good terms now. Even with Japan, which was a much more intense fight between America. Um, so there's this weird forgiveness, I guess, that happens uh, sometimes. And a great story of that even was um, someone that I personally knew, uh, Mr. Forbes, who was my father's bagpipe teacher. He was a Spitfire pilot in the Second World War. And after the war, I won't tell you all this stuff, but after the Second World War, he became friends with Hannah Reich at an air show. Hannah Reich was Hitler's personal pilot. They both loved airplanes, though. And the war was over. And you see this a lot, especially from the British, is that even my grandfather, after the war, when he moved to America, immigrated, um, he, uh, they had German neighbors. And according to everyone I know who was involved at that time, uh, he never said anything against them. There was this sense of the war's over, let's, you know, rebuild let's get on with it and there's this weird sense of respect that we find in Iliad with um and I think that also happens a lot more when you have two cultures that are similar fighting each other so for instance like I'm I'm not I'm not being anachronistic here by like taking stuff that more recent history and comparing it because the thing is this book has eternal like truths in it like the things people do in this are a lot of the same things that people do today the scene where Andromache is with or takes her baby boy and tries to keep Hector from leaving it's like I don't know if you've seen videos of soldier like you've seen videos i'm sure of soldiers coming back from deployment but have you seen videos of soldiers leaving it's really heartbreaking and in this she's even she's trying to shame him she's like saying like you don't even care about me like of course she knows he cares about her she's angry she's not and she's being kind of angry with him but she's not really angry at him she loves him which is such a cool thing to see this old story where it's like they both care, like the scene where Hector throws his son up into the air and prays that he will be better than him one day. It's so tender and intimate and it's the home front. It's like, you know, every scene in every war movie where a guy is at the train station and he's saying goodbye to his sweetheart except instead of a train he's just going to the other side of the wall and they can hear the enemy fighting right there they can hear people dying and when Hector comes in and he sees all the other women and children and all the other kinsmen being like is is did you see my son is he okay it's like that's a really rough moment but he takes his time with each one of them Hector is we haven't found anything with Hector yet that we don't like. <laughs> Isn't he supposed to be the bad guy here? Isn't He's the champion of the enemy, right? Because if we're reading this and we're supposed to kind of be reading it as Greeks or listening to it, you know, it's like if I made a story today about the Revolutionary War, okay, and I had it be that the British were the good guys, you wouldn't even want to hear it, right? <laughs> why, why, why would you care about that? You know, but this be, this story has been so wildly important throughout history that we even have it today. How do we even have this thing? It's amazing. And uh, we're like, all but one other of the epic poems in the epic cycle failed. I don't want to say fail, that seems mean, but they died, you know, like, we don't have them anymore. We have Iliad, and one of the reasons is because it's the most important one. It's the one that everybody loved the most. It's the one that everybody watched the most. Like, out of all the, if you've got a series of movies you like, but there's that one that you just keep watching over and over again, like your favorite Star Wars movie or your favorite Marvel movie or whatever, that's this. And so anyway, we've got... Um, I think it's also cool that Andromache, she is described as white-armed, or ivory-armed and white-armed Andromache. It's like, okay, <clears throat> who else do we know who's described that way? Hera, the wife of Zeus, 
the goddess of marriage and women and childbirth. It's like these wholesome things. And um, so now we also see, um, I'm going to start to, oh, also Helen of Troy. Woo, she tries to seduce Hector. What? What? She tries, she like, <laughs> she's like, you know, your husband, he's like, your little brother isn't a real man like you. Why don't you come here and sit down? And he's like, no, nah, <laughs> not going to do it. What a bro. Oh my gosh. Like that guy. Now, here's where we might find it a little hard to relate to some people of the past, which is that Hector being, um, not sleeping with Helen is not necessarily him being quote faithful to his wife because back then i don't really know exactly what the rules in troy were but it would not be unusual for a guy to be allowed to impregnate several women all right now it's possible that there were people back when this story came out who maybe didn't like that like there's all kinds of social norms that everybody accepts quote but no, they don't. People have problems with it. Maybe there is something that, like, maybe it made Hector a more dreamy character. I don't know. Um, maybe it's just coincidence it worked out that way. Because what he says is that my heart is out there with my men. Now, this is an interesting thought because I'm going to talk about another ancient text, the Bible, where something similar happened in one of the stories. I believe it's in the book of Samuel. It might be the second book of Samuel, but, you know, King David, David and Goliath, and we'll get to that story some other time. Oh, my gosh, when will this channel end? But um, there's a point where a veteran or a, a, not, a soldier who's fighting a war comes to visit David, and David's like, why don't you, uh, you know, go back to your wife, you know, uh, get in bed with her, mm get your rocks off man and he's like I'm, i i gotta just get back to the front i just gotta get back to the war that's where my men are all right now there's there's a lot of other stuff going on in that story and stuff but this sense of like no the, my brothers are out there i need to go now i can't enjoy myself here right now i have to go like the guilt the shame of it and he brings it up he's like how could i look at the other the wives of the other men out there if I stayed, how could I do that? I my heart won't let me. So um, that's uh, something to really think about. Um, now, one of the little subtleties. There's a couple beautiful subtleties here in the text that I really love. One is that Hector talks about how he has learned to be one of the best, to fight in Troy's first ranks, defending my father's honor and my own. Okay. Um, when he sees his son and he reaches for him and he has his helmet, his son is scared. And so Hector takes the helmet off. And then his son recognizes him. Hector doesn't go around his house with his helmet. Hector at heart is not Achilles. Achilles is born to be a warrior. Hector is born to be a husband and father. So much so that his son doesn't even recognize him. His son is scared of him. And when he takes the helmet off, the helmet that we're always hearing about, the gleaming helmet, the gleaming helmet, the gleaming helmet, the bright helmet, reflecting light, yada yada yada. When he takes it off, that's when he's really Hector, I think. And, wow. You know, so another beautiful thing is when he's talking to his mom. His mom's like, oh, honey, here, uh, have some food, have some wine. You know, oh, my gosh, moms, happy Mother's Day, uh, by the way. Um, uh, yesterday, I believe it was. So uh, the um, – but he tells her, like, get your best robe and offer it to the goddess, Athena. And the little detail is it's the robe that's at the bottom of the chest. It's the one that – she like she never wears it it's her favorite one and it's under all the other ones you know it's at the bottom and it's there's something i don't think i even have to talk a lot about that there's just something so precious and personal about that like when you have your great grandmother's china that you never even use you know <laughs> um it's like you're supposed to use it, the dishes you're supposed to wear them the clothes you know but that's her favorite most precious one 
and she takes it from the bottom of the chest and with all the other women the older women they go up to the acropolis to offer it to the goddess athena like how sad would that be if you're in a imagine imagine you, you you're in such a desperate scenario that your mom has to sell her pearls or her wedding dress you know that thing that she doesn't even show off to people all that, it's hers it's her favorite thing and she's please take this and will and and save the city think of the people it's so tragic and the old women all go up there would have been more old women typically in the ancient world than old men for in times of war for in in warlike cultures i guess is it men died a lot let me put it that way and um there's uh you hear about a couple old men but um everybody keeps getting killed especially in sparta by the way men were dying all the time there but um yeah there, there's just something so crazy there and we even see at the end of this book here where hector talks about fighting for freedom like the greeks are like what are we even fighting for we're fighting so menelaus can get his wife back we're fighting for armor that we're picking off guys that we barely know you know we're just getting bronze i've already got armor like what are we even fighting for other men's wives and and recognition and fame and quote immortality through the ages but the trojans they are fighting for their lives they have to be there they are fighting for their wives they are fighting for their children and there's a really depressing despair in this because andromache mentions a prophecy that maybe the greeks found out hector says that he knows in his heart he's gonna die and troy is going to be sacked and his wife is going to be enslaved and he offers up a prayer for his son who he doesn't name a fate for he doesn't say what's going to happen to his son but he says a prayer for him so <sighs> there's um there's so much to all of this and i think that one of the yeah, they literally say he's fighting for freedom. Now, one of the things that's also, of course, very obvious in this uh, book, uh, book six, is that we get a glimpse into the life of the women. All right. Now, this is a book that's known for war and killing and, da, 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 you know, boys having fun and chariots, you know, killing each other, bows and arrows, knives and swords, javelins, shields, rah, rending of skulls. You know, but it's also viewed as very graphic and tragic. It's weird how it the tone shift goes from this is glorious and awesome to this guy's dad is going to be really sad. <laughs> you know, um, it's like you've got two ideas fighting each other in this story. The ideas of the Greeks, which is the idea of glorifying violence and glorifying war, and the idea of the Trojans, what war is really like. And those two ideas are fighting in this story. And um, we get to see the lives of women in Troy. Now, I thought I kind of knew something about this. and uh, But when I was brushing up some of my research and prep for this episode, oh my gosh. Wow. Um, so <laughs> we find we one of the things I want to point out is that when people refer to men and women as the stronger or weaker sex in this kind of thing that's very literal where men are physically stronger and women are physically weaker by comparison to men um, so that's what that is talking about now throughout greek history there's a lot of greek history women were treated in different ways and it really de uh depended i don't just want to say treated because that makes it sound like they didn't have any like you know influence on their own lives but 
um, they it also really depended on what like city you were in, um, what culture you were in. Spartan women famously were way more free than all of the other women in Greece. Uh, like it's uh, more so probably then in some ways than anybody is now. Um, but <laughs> it's um, so. Uh, but uh, the what what did women do back then? Okay, did they just like sit around and have babies? Well, they did both of those things, and um, at least one of those things is maddeningly important. Uh, especially in a world where people are dying all the time. Um, it's like when we see Helen in the last time and this time, what's she doing? She's working. All right. It's like she's royalty. Why is she working? Is this just a hobby? Well, no. She was working. Okay. Now, at the, they mentioned the loom. Okay. Now, I think that some people get really down on uh some women in history is like oh well, they were just weaving all day it's like i want you to imagine a world where you can't buy clothes from wherever you want for like no money suddenly weaving becomes extremely important you need clothes you need blankets you need bags you need stuff and women made that stuff a lot of the time and so that's like that's important. That's something that everybody has they're do dealing with every day. And um, different clothes also, of course, could uh, show what kind of status you had, obviously. Um, now, it's really hard to make any type of sweeping statement about women in ancient Greece because there's so many different like things that happen in different time periods and just the different cultures were so different. Also, this is Troy, so we don't know as much about that. Um, but there's some things that I thought would be interesting to bring up. For instance, um, you've got uh, now something we do know about Troy, ha ha ha, and what was actually normal uh, in the ancient world at that time. Obviously, normal doesn't mean everywhere all the time, but it, the keys of the treasury belonged to the queen. She was the one in charge of the money. Uh, so it's like if you wanted to get some gold to give someone or for a sacrifice, you had to talk to – the king had to say, darling, I have the keys to the treasure. And she'd be like, what do you want? All right, that, that kind of thing happened. There actually was power there. There was a lot of influence. One of the things we see is that there are priestesses. Um, women were extremely – influential in religion in this sort of Mediterranean ancient world um, in fact like you kind of at different points in Greek history like you could not go to war without the approval from the gods and usually that was from the Oracle of Delphi or Delphi depending on how you say it remember this show is not always so great with the names but um, <laughs> One of the groups of women that was mentioned here that I do want to talk about more extensively is the Amazons. Hurrah! Now, Amazons, were they real? Good question. Thank you for asking. Well, you see, the Amazons, it kind of depends. Let's start small. Were there ever warrior women in history? Answer, yes. Very much so. Uh, obviously, you know, you got Viking shield maidens. That Those were a thing. Um, you know, even in as recent as World War II in Russia, you had women snipers and pilots and bombers and all kinds of stuff. So um, women have um, added to the annals of military history over the millennia. Now, as far as if there was a group called the Amazons, well, they're mentioned quite a bit, and they're actually depicted in a lot of Greek art. But there's a there is no hard evidence that the Amazons were real, meaning we haven't found like a tomb of an Amazon exactly. But 
A lot of people think that the Amazons were based on the Scythians or Scythians, depending on how you say it. Remember, <laughs> show. Um, and people say that one differently, like Messene and Mecene and Mycene and stuff. So the Scythians, um, it was not uncommon for women to be involved with, like, especially the horse archers. Okay. Now there is there is, there are some things we do know weren't true. Okay, for instance, the word Amazon, some people think, means like, well, Maison means breast, and A means without. So think like asexual is like you're not interested in sex, all right? Um, but then with the Amazons, people thought, oh, without breast. And so they thought that in order to use a bow, they would cut off a breast so that the string wouldn't thwap them. But uh, that's... Uh, ridiculous and stupid because um, we uh, know that women can do archery just fine without you know that without getting in the way of themselves and there we also know who the guy was um, I forget his name it starts with an H who was like oh I think this is why he just came up with it and also if a Amazon can mean without breast well then you'd think that the Greeks would depict Amazons without breasts because they spoke Greek right I mean who was I mean if they weren't who was back then so I actually want to show you a couple of uh, images here um, so for Amazons and I want to see if you can pick out a few things now I can't tell if you can see the cursor on the screen or not I think you can't so I'm not gonna like point to too much stuff but here we see an Amazon being defeated by some guy, being pulled by the hair. Yes, she does in fact have breasts and a shield. Look at that big old shield. Now, Amazons were typically viewed as, um, you know, very, like, as the equals of men, as very strong, brave warriors. But here's the weird thing about the Amazons, which is that they always lose. Now here you can see that some of these Amazons in this picture here are, um, they're, the, the one has a sort of moon-shaped shield, so that's a little bit more foreign. And they're wearing pants! Pants! How scandalous, I say. Look, they must be barbarians. Ah, oh, my goodness. Pants! After all. Not just because pants were things that men wore, because in fact they kind of, a lot of the time, weren't. Um, the Greeks, as you can see, weren't so into pants. Um, but, you know, they wore more like kilts and things of that nature. Pants were considered barbaric for a long time, even uh, by the Romans. So when uh, the Romans ran into my ancient ancestors and saw them wearing pants, they thought, Oh, I say, these um, British people must be... Why am I using a British accent for a Roman talking about limeys? Um, anyway, pants were barbaric to that part of the world. So, uh, let's see, um, once again, remember, uh, I think we're on episode six. Do I have to reiterate this show isn't for children? <laughs> well, let's, uh, see. What does this remind you of? Uh, those of you less innocent in my audience, perhaps. Hmm, yanking hair from behind. Hmm, 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 the skirt coming up. What could that be? Oh, my breast has fallen out. Well, yes, you see, because whether the Amazons were real or not, one thing that we do know was real was pornography. Yes, that's, that's, that's what you were looking at there. Yeah, um, what, you think the Greeks made a bunch of statues of naked people and never thought, what if we made porn? Of course they did. So, anyway... Uh, yeah, you've got strong warrior women who are always being defeated by men, but putting up a fight. You're, that's, that's that. Now, another example of something like that is all the way back in book one, um, when I was reading when Athena comes up behind Achilles and grabs him by the hair. She's totally dominating him. Yeah, that's, that's what's going on there. It's like, it's like, oh... Pallas Athena step on me <laughs> that's what it was about so um the Amazons a lot of the time were used as pornography they were also used as like you know really strong warriors for heroes to fight they weren't totally one-dimensional but in fact the Amazons show up in the epic cycle of which of course Iliad is a part of because the Amazons Eventually, they they allied. Uh, remember, we're in year like nine of the war. The allies am the the Amazons allied with Troy, and there's this whole little story that we don't have the full poem on, but we have references to, where uh, Pen Penthesilia, the um, Amazon leader, 
fights Achilles. And what we find out is that this Amazon has a history with Achilles. And um, perhaps they were comrades in arms before, and now because they're on opposite sides, they got hired by two different people. They have to fight each other, and Achilles defeats her and kills her. Sad. Um, I think. I think it's terrifically sad. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we got hair getting pulled. Uh, so, um, now, uh, the roles of women in Greece, it really depends on the time period and also who you're talking to. Some people will point out that I believe it was Aristotle. Let me check my notes. Yes, Aristotle clearly wanted women to be subservient. He was like, they should obey men all the time and just do that. But then you've got Plato, who wanted women to be equally um, educated and trained in everything, including the arts of war, on an equal footing with boys. And then you've got um, all kinds of like different ideas going around for that. Sparta, a woman could, um, you know, have two husbands, you know, uh, so that was encouraged. And now some people might point out that there's something rather interesting about Helen here, which is she's the queen of Sparta, correct? Yes, she is. Spartan women are known to never weave because the Spartans had a slave class called the Helots who did all that stuff for them, like, or who were forced to do that for them. And so the Helots did all the weaving. So why is Helen weaving? Ah, now she has to do the weaving. Well, no, that I, I wish that was how the story worked because it would be like, that's so interesting. Now she's kind of a slave and she's having to think about life differently. But that's not what would have happened in this story because um, the time that this story takes place and the time that it was written or composed is before Sparta conquered uh, the Messenians, not Mycenae, to a different group, M-E-S-S. -S. They conquered that area and made those people the Helots. Uh, so Helots were not around when this book was made. When I first was like, oh my gosh, I found this timeline thing. I was like, ah, oh, freaking out. But actually, this is just a really old story. So yes, she would have been weaving and used to that kind of thing. Um, uh, let's see. I think it's also, when we're talking about history... And stuff keeping a house is seen as a typically boring thing to do which is what the women did but um that was every day all day like what uh, what's happening with all the money what's happening with all the food what's happening with what everybody's wearing like almost everything that happened with everybody all day was in like from this from the house way of thinking was the dominion of women um, and it was wildly important. Now, this isn't to say that women were not oppressed in a lot of scenarios here, because they totally were. Um, like in Athens, um, women kind of like just weren't allowed outside very much. But then again, it depended what kind of a woman you were. If you were a prostitute, you were independent, and you could go and do whatever you want and make lots of money. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the, the short thing is that it's just really complicated. Um, and there's so much to it. Um, but yeah, there's so many things that I, that I've, I've seen some, some people refer to as like almost frivolous work. Like they're weaving, oh, they're getting water and stuff. It's like, well, that's kind of a very first world way of looking at the roles of women here. It's like, yeah, well, when you've got a sink in your house, getting water from a well doesn't seem that important. Um, you know, or when you can just buy your clothes all made by people you don't know and don't like to think about, uh, you know, weaving doesn't seem that important or same with like your blankets or your chair or whatever. Um, but when you think about that, all that had to be made by somebody that you personally knew it became more important. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's so interesting because like, even if you think about say, and sort of anachronistically American history for when like women finally could like I guess own property or divorce or things of that nature it's like well women in Athens could do that ages ago um, they could uh, open a business uh, they could dress pretty much how they wanted um, they could become priestesses although that was a very difficult competitive job because um, you you could become wildly powerful as a priest have so much influence a priestess excuse me um, yeah, so let's see what else we got. Uh, but yeah, all the things that women in Sparta would do, like run, javelin, disc, uh, and all that, 
the first women, first woman to win at the ancient Olympics, um, was uh, where I wrote her name down, Kaniska. I believe I'm saying that right. Who won because now women weren't allowed to compete in the ancient Olympics. How'd she do that? Did she fake her gender? Well, not not this time. What happened was that she, although the women had their own Olympics, apparently, that was kind of cool to find out, and the Spartan women always won, um, but uh, this woman trained horses. She bred and trained horses, and they had chariot races, and her, her horses won. And she uh, was wildly honored for this. She had a, a bronze statue of horses a driver and herself in the temple of zeus at olympia um you know and places all over the rest of greece um there were also festivals that only women could go to so you hear about the boys going off and partying but you also hear about yeah well the women apparently did then apparently there was a lot of trash talk and <laughs> stuff like that going on so they just, you know the girls got to have their time and just cut loose which i think is uh, very good and healthy um Let's see the um ba, ba, ba. I'm going through my notes. I'm like kind of like almost skipping some of this stuff. Not quite. I think it's a good time for me to go to the chat. Let's see if anyone's here. Um, let's see. Oh wow! Holy cow! We've got a chat. Okay. Um, that's a lot of chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and machine gun this as much as I can. We'll see what we'll do here. All right. So we got <clears throat> Benji the Koi Boy says. I'm here, I'm Vernier, I'm riding a steer. I'm very glad to have you here, Benji the Koi Boy. Um, okay, Joy's one, uh, Joe is one up in me with writing something that's actually Greek, which I do not know how to do. Uh, I hope he's saying hello or something uh, very nice and flattering, but um, well done, Joe. All right, so Bubba the, mu Bubba the Musician says howdy. Um, oh, Allie, my girlfriend, says, nice mask. Thank you, Allie. Remember, guys, there is a link to the description in the, in the description below if you want to get a fancy, fancy mask. Um, very reasonable rates, I might add. Um, Joe says I'm backwards again. That's very strange because when I went back and looked at the last video, it wasn't mirrored, so I don't know why it's doing that. Um, okay, so Bubba says, show us your face. Yes, dirty jokes are fun. Um, Goram Darth Cal says, I want a mask. There, link in the description, man. Go get one. Uh, Emilio Rossi says, you are beautiful. Well, thank you, Emilio. Joe Eberly says, corporate sellout. Ha 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 ha, JK. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I wish. <laughs> if anyone's watching this, I would love to sell out. Um, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, let's see. Uh, seriously, I think the masks are great. Good. Thank you, Joe. Benji the Koi Boy says, I feel like these morale-boosting battle speeches are the origin of the basketball coach movie genre. I think you're right, Benji the Koi Boy. Oh, Benji the Koi Boy continues, Our team can win if we just get the right pep talk. That's right. Well, hey, you know, it's a lot of stuff that goes on is just in people's heads you know when people feel like they can do something somehow it becomes more possible occasionally but there's so much are there any other things that are happening in this story that you recognize in stories you love perhaps two armies facing off not fighting and then one jerk like shoots one of them and it makes everything worse that happened uh we got joe again saying e yes love the scottish accent oh well thank you joe um that that one's not as although my family has a lot of scottish stuff going on all the time um it's uh that that one is harder for me to do so i hope it remains passable for all y'all um say joe says wow i wonder if that's where football players get the idea for exchanging jerseys after a game huh yeah because when um glaucus and uh diomedes exchanged their armor you know what? I don't know. Maybe that's how they got the idea. That's that's actually possible. Um, because athletics and nerdy stuff like reading used to be way more related to each other um, before you know you could only do one thing extracurricular in school. Uh, let's see. Benji the Koi Boy says, There have been several moments in this episode where the Pokemon theme song would feel very appropriate. I've thought about using music. Uh, occasionally but i've also thought it would be better not to and i'll you know uh, we'll see 
Um, but not to mention Otto Scorzini. Yes, all right, so Bubba the Musician is talking about um, how I said uh, Mr. Forbes became friends with Hannah Reich after the Second World War. That wasn't the only person that he met and became friends with. He became friends with Otto Scorzini, um, who has a very interesting post-war story. And who is Otto Scorzini? Well, I'll just suffice it to say um, that Winston Churchill referred to Otto Scorzini as the most dangerous man in Europe. So, um, da, da, da. Oh, okay, so apparently I've been sent some pictures on my phone that are pertinent to the conversation. Um, I am quite certain the father had been in France in 1917 to 1918. Let me just take a second about... Um, okay, I'm not going to deal with this right now. I'm going to go through the rest of the chat, though, so hang on, uh, Bubba. So, Benji the Koi Boy, if anyone is enjoying seeing the ladies' side of these conflicts, I'd highly recommend if we, uh, uh, till, sorry, I highly recommend Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. It's set in a fictional state near Greece and near the, and near the end features a conversation between a queen and a soldier's wife. That's one of my favorite scenes in fiction. Hmm. Um, yeah, C.S. Lewis, um, is one of my heroes and uh, I can't believe I haven't read that book yet myself um, I've got like f five of his that aren't even Narnia books on my shelf right now uh, okay so let's see Ali says Andromache's monologue was so touching heart and you did such a good job as Hector Aw, thanks babe I hope we never get in that situation <laughs> Benji the Koi Boy says, I am biased as it is uh, my all-time favorite book, LOL. Yes, uh, uh, Till We Have Faces is Benji's favorite book. I'll give you the meatball cards. You can do the Italian accent for the Romans. Oh, sweet. Okay, I'll be doing um, some uh, <laughs> I'll be doing some Italian accents for a character, like, eh, hey, Troy or something. Um, all right, Alexandra, once again, says, you can... Uh, okay, well... Yeah, this is a public chat, Allie. Um, wow. Okay, so... <laughs> this show is live. Keep it together, man. Okay, I'll take it. I'm blushing. Holy... Yeah. I can't believe you said that. Oh, my gosh. Well, in case all of you are wondering if I'm a very happy, lucky person... Um, <laughs> Uh, cool. Uh, anyhow. Alright, yeah, if, uh... <laughs> in case you can't read this chat, I hope you can, uh, but the chat, she says, you can yank my hair anytime, kissy face, oops, lol. And she says, yay, I got the last comment, so... Okay, well, um... I think that's just the best note to end on, probably. Uh, we've got a lot going on there. But if you want to learn more about um, the roles of women in ancient Greece or uh, other areas around that, or other points in history, here's a huge misconception that I find with a lot of people, is that they think that since history is, quote, written by men, that there's not a lot of material on what women were doing. And that's not extremely true. Um, there is a lot of material out there on what women have been doing for thousands of years because, believe it or not, they have had a huge influence on um, a lot of things that have gone on beyond just being, you know, Helen in this story. Uh, so, yeah, the um, anyone who I, I, I maintain that anyone who is familiar with uh, with women will not find it too hard to believe that uh, even in societies and situations where their political aspirations were extremely limited they have found ways to influence the goings on in the world and also um, I think that a lot of women who are familiar with men will understand uh, or not find it too hard to believe especially after this conversation between Hector and Andromache, that um, 
men loving women is not a new thing and uh that um you know that perfect guy who will listen to you well we got evidence that he's right here baby so anyway uh so yeah it's uh it's really interesting to see how these characters are so relatable in a world that kind of seems hard to relate to in so many superficial ways it's like what people are talking about and what they're really worried about and things like that are so gosh darn eternal in the truths that they tell so um i like to do i don't want this to be like the one-off woman episode or anything like that because it's they're part of the story you know the story is about people and so we'll hear more about what uh goes on from that side of the story it's very touching to see a home front look at this though and the concern that the men and women have for each other um especially when this book opens up with like guys trading women like uh objects you know like oh take take the girl oh I, i'm gonna take your girl and all this stuff and then we got a man who genuinely loves his wife and son you know it's it's complicated kind of depended who you were and where you were and then benji the coy boy says um i don't see her comments on my feed lol oh wait there it is oh and um benji the coy boy says i nominate aeneas as your italian stereotype character i'll give it a shot when i'm preparing but no promises okay cool so with that everybody i think that uh that's it for episode six um very good i hope you've enjoyed this i certainly have and we will be back again this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time for Book 7 of Iliad, which, of course, is also Episode 7 of Peter Presents. So, have a wonderful rest of your evening, and um, I hope you have a wonderful night. As for me, I am going to call my girlfriend. Ha, <laughs> ha,